We are at the Chiesa della Santissima Trinità dei Pellegrini, the Church of the Most Holy Trinity of the Pilgrims, for a Mass which will celebrate the 25th anniversary of the priestly fraternity of St. Peter. The celebrant of the Mass is the Superior General of the priestly fraternity, very Reverend Father John Berg. And he will be assisted by a deacon and subdeacon. The subdeacon is Father William Barker, who is assigned to Santa Trinita while he's doing his studies in Rome. Mass has now begun with the prayers at the foot of the altar. The Church of Santa Trinita was founded originally at the urging of St. Philip Neri as a kind of hospice church for pilgrims and travelers, and it returns to that use today, filled with pilgrims from especially the United States, but several from all over the world who are part of the confraternity of St. Peter, a group founded a few years ago to join the work of the fraternity by their prayers and good works. The color of the Mass is red, although St. Luke did not actually die a martyr. But to the first person who comes up with the correct answer to why there should be red, re red vestments on the day of a confessor, Father Joseph Bissig, the founder of the Fraternity of St. Peter, will award that person a dollar bill, which you can collect from him in person the next time you find yourself in Denton, Nebraska, where he's rector of the seminary there. Now there'll be the incensation of the altar, which comes at the very beginning of Mass, after the prayers at the foot of the altar. The altar, of course, is Christ, which is why you'll see there are steps leading up to the top of the altar, uh, because we always look up. The altar is not only Christ, it is Christ on Calvary. Therefore, the altar is always at the highest point, and at its center, there's always the tabernacle in which Christ, in his goodness, has vouchsafed to live amongst us until the very end of the world. The cross at the top of the altar is incensed first, and then the top of the altar, the sides of the altar, the table of the altar, the bottom of the altar, it's given the kind of reverence that Christ himself would be given and that he indeed was given, was given to his dead body after he died on the cross. psalm of an antiphon, a portion of a psalm, the glory be to the Father, and then the repetition of the antiphon of the psalm. Non-Catholics watching this Mass will note that there's a tremendous amount of scripture in the Catholic Mass, all through the Mass. It's, it's rich with scriptural 
quotations and references and readings. Much of this Mass is celebrated in a low voice by the priest because the choir will be singing parts such as the introit and the gradual which in excess is the center and he has just begun the gloria of the mass and he's joined there by the deacon and subdeacon who will pronounce the words of the gloria with him in a low voice whilst the choir sings the words of the gloria at the conclusion of their recitation of the Gloria, the celebrant Father Bird, the deacon, and the subdeacon go to sit at the sedilia, which is a seat in which they will remain while the choir finishes their singing of the Gloria, which of course takes quite a bit longer than just the recitation by the celebrant at the altar itself. We'll see them doffing their berettas every now and then uh, when the holy name is mentioned or at certain points in the singing of the Gloria where it's prescribed by the rubrics that the priest should bow his head. And that's why they'll be looking like they're taking their hats on and off. Church of Santa Trinita was entrusted to the priestly fraternity of St. Peter by Pope Emeritus Benedict in the year 2008 and is the church provided in a particular way in the city of Rome for those Catholics who come and who are attached to the traditional Mass. They can find it here every day at Santa Trinita. church was built later upon the same ground uh, some, some years later. celebrant with deacon and subdeacon will rise and return to the altar 
where Father Berg will go to the Epistle side and there he will sing the opening prayer, the Collect of the Mass, which makes reference to St. Luke's apparently having had the stigmata, the marks of our Lord's crucifixion on his body, which is a very ancient tradition within the Church, although Scripture doesn't mention it. Um, it's ancient traditional part of um, what we know about St. Luke's life. There's a shot of the church which is quite filled with not only the pilgrims here from the USA today, but with a number of local people, of course, from Rome who wanted to be here to celebrate the fraternity's anniversary. in the gospel through all the church. churches for many, many centuries in the story of the Sorokins to St. Luke, who we knew, we know, traveled with St. Paul on his mission.
Now, the celebrant will read the gradual and the Alleluia verse of the Mass, which will be sung at the same time by the choir, and then he'll probably go to the city leave because, of course, the choir's singing will take longer than his reading of that fairly short scriptural passage. We then prepare for the gospel, which uh, is the same one used on the feast of St. Titus, who is mentioned also in the epistle of today's Mass. of the Lord appointing a further 72 to complete the work that the apostles were already engaged in at that time. And of course, again, sacred tradition tells us that St. Luke was very probably amongst them since his gospel has so many details that would only have been known by one who was an eyewitness. And now, Father Berg prepares the incense which will be used in the gospel procession, because today the gospel is sung and candles are held near the book and incense is used because Mass is in the solemn sun form this morning. The deacon now kneels before Father Bird to receive his blessing before he joins the procession to lead to the singing of the gospel. contains the words, Peace be to this house. And we will hear those words chanted with particular thanksgiving to God for having given us through Pope Benedict this beautiful church to be a house for the traditional Latin Mass in perpetuity. And this gospel ends with the words, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. So even those who are watching this Mass on the internet can remember that God is as close to each one of you as he is to those who are amongst the privileged to be actually in the Church of Santa Trinita today. incensed before the singing begins as a sign of our prayers rising up to God like sweet incense as Holy Scripture puts it.
the conclusion of the Gospel, the subdeacon will take the book of the Gospels to Father Berg, who will kiss the words of Holy Scripture which have just been chanted, and then he will be incensed by the deacon of the Mass. At the conclusion of that brief ceremony, Father Berg will deliver his sermon, which you will be privileged to hear. Here in the broadcast house, we can't hear him, we can only see him. I can hear the vendors singing outside the window, and the dogs barking in front of the bush, and they're not Father Berg's sermon. So we'll have a privilege to hear which I will have to miss. Per prima vorrei ringraziare la parrocchia e il parroco qui alla Santissima Trinità dei Pellegrini per la sua accoglienza oggi per questa festività per il nostro anniversario. Siamo molto molto in grato, ma la predica oggi sarà in inglese, soprattutto perché parlo molto meglio inglese, e anche per tutti i pellegrini che vengono dagli Stati Uniti e l'Inghilterra che sono qui con noi oggi. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. It was not you that chose me. It was I that chose you. The task I have appointed you is to go out and bear fruit, fruit which will endure. My dear confreres, dear fellow priests, dear faithful, and especially members of the confraternity of St. Peter, during the course of this year, our fraternity has been joyfully celebrating its 25th anniversary in a sort of ongoing Te Deum in different countries and on different continents throughout the world in the places where it serves the Church. In France, our confreres will render thanks to the Blessed Virgin Mary at her shrine in Lourdes. Our priests in North America will go to the first churches which were began by Blessed Unipero Sarah in the New World to render thanks again to God for these 25 years for this foundation of our fraternity. But today, on the Feast of St. Luke, 25 years to the day from the moment in which we were erected here within this city, we are pleased to be able to be here in Rome, ad limina, as they say, at the threshold of the tombs of St. Peter and Paul in order to celebrate properly this gift from Holy Mother Church, which she has confided to us in erecting the priestly fraternity of St. Peter. In accordance with the charism and the identity which was laid out from the very first moment in our constitutions, that it is, to be an institute whose aim is the sanctification of priests through the exercise of the pastoral ministry in particular by conforming the life of the priest to the sacrifice which he offers each and every day at the altar in accordance with the disciplinary traditions which were laid out in the motu proprio Ecclesia Dei. The words of the Alleluia, the verse which was sung today for the Feast of St. Luke, therefore take on today a particular added meaning for our fraternity. It was not you that chose me, it was I that chose you. The task I have appointed is for you to go out and to bear fruit, and that your fruit will remain. We often speak of vocations in a very general or broad sense, in speaking that each soul is called to a different state in life in order to serve God in accord with his divine providence. But Pope Pius XII tells us that a vocation can be spoken about in the most proper terms when it is a call from the Church, when it is she who gives the vocation. What can be said of the individual can also analogously be said for an institute. 
It is the church who chooses. It is the church who calls. It is the church who gives the mission to send them out like Christ, two by two, to precede him wherever they might go. And so it was that the Holy See deigned to establish our priestly fraternity immediately as a society of apostolic life of pontifical right. It was in the person of blessed John Paul II, successor of St. Peter, who gave ecclesiastical recognition and the identity which this group sought on this day 25 years ago. In so doing, he established a small group which would have a firm role within the church in a certain way against the entire current in which things were moving. He gave them an authentic Catholic spirit to celebrate divine worship according to the guidelines of immemorial, immemorial tradition. It is therefore a day to render great thanks to God for the purity of heart and for the courage of our founders, who a bit like unto our patron St. Peter, lanced out into the deep, duke in altum, as the gospel cry of Christ tells St. Peter, that on 25 years ago from today, there were but 12 priests as founders, and now the priestly fraternity numbers over 250 priests, that we have gone from serving a number of apostolates that could be counted on one hand to serving in 170 different locations throughout the world, in going from a handful of seminarians who had no place to call home to now having two international seminaries in Lincoln, Nebraska and in Vygotsbad, Germany, where 150 men now take their formation. Years before our founders had come here, they had originally sought out a seminary formation which was offered to them by Monsignor Marcel Lefebvre. It was a priestly formation which was very difficult to find any other place within the world, this strong priestly identity. They have always remained grateful for the formation which they, which they received and which they have passed on to our priestly fraternity. We know these founders well. Like under St. Peter, they're far from being perfect men. They have their own faults. But we know that God chose them in his providence to take a certain path, and we thank them for the purity of heart and for the courage which they showed 25 years ago in making a very important decision to follow the church. On our coat of arms, there are tears alongside the keys of St. Peter. They, of course, represent the triple confession of St. Peter in his response to our Lord after having betrayed him. They are meant to be assigned to us as priests and also to you as members of the confraternity that we were born at a time of sorrow and at a moment of crisis for the church, but they are also to be a reminder to us of the humility that we ought to have, that we've been given a role within the church which is small and that we are simply called to carry it out faithfully, to serve Christ and to feed his sheep, as our Lord told St. Peter. From its very foundation, our fraternity has sought to serve exactly in that manner. It has received generous means from the Church in order to accomplish that task. And our founders considered that these means were particularly apt not only for 50 years ago or 500 years ago within the life of the Church, but for today, for the work that needs to be done, for the souls who need to be won for Christ, for the work which is that of the Church. These pillars were given to us as being the studies of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Old Mass, or what is now called the Extraordinary Form, and of course, a particular attachment to the See of St. Peter. The first pillar which was there was the study of St. Thomas, an important pillar which was there from the beginning, of not only simply having a catechism, but of finding once again that perennial philosophy which has always been the bulwark of theology within the life of the Church. From the 19th century, the Church has looked to address an increasingly secularized world, a world which continually moves further and further away from Christ and seems to have no place for the voice of the Church. She has continually sought to put that voice forward within the world in which we live. Our Holy Father, Pope Francis, has echoed this cry again and again, that the Church must speak to the world, that it must be that light once again, that it must disturb things in a certain way, that it must have the audacity to go forward and to preach the truth. But popes in history have shown that the best way in order to do this is to really rely upon St. Thomas, this surety and this bulwark of the faith, 
that it is the very best means to address this world in which we live. The world cannot be addressed with ambiguities and with a sort of mealy mouth presentation of the faith. It needs to hear what genuinely is the truth and what the Church has to offer. In the end, man's heart, as St. Augustine said, is restless until it rests in God. He recognizes in the profundity of himself that he lacks something, that as St. Thomas would tell us, and Aristotle long before him, that good, that that which he truly seeks, happiness, cannot be found within himself, that there is a law, as St. Paul would say, which battles within himself, which is original sin, and that he has need for something which is more, the saving grace of Christ, the teaching of the Holy Catholic Church. This is the best proof of man's insufficiency and what man in the world needs to hear today. Also in a social setting, the truth about the family as being the building block of society, something that was taught even long before St. Thomas by the Greeks themselves, of being able to see that this is something which is non-negotiable and at the very foundation of the society in which we live, this need to return to the natural law. But our founders saw that simply catechesis and teaching would not be enough, that there needed to be also a liturgy and a worship of God which underlined the same things which were believed. They said often that the finest sermon that could be given with regard, for example, to the real presence of our Lord was nothing if the actions of the priest at the altar didn't underline the same realities, that the manner in which he treated the sacred species must in the end repeat in a very visible way that which he had preached. And as we say in English, a picture is worth a thousand year, wor- the picture is worth a thousand words. And so too the liturgy is indeed a very profound teacher, one in which we can see the realities of the faith, one which we need to return to. Here again, Pope Francis has called to ve- us to the very much the same thing. He has warned us again and again of narcissism, of a society and even of priests who turn in upon themselves, who consider themselves to be as stars, and can only think of themselves. But it is in this liturgy where it is really truly underlined to what extent the the priest needs to disappear. The Pope is right. We can't hold on to this liturgy because of nostalgia or because of a misplaced ideological manner of holding on to it. But it must be a powerful manner of communicating the faith and the truth about man and the truth about God's divine mysteries. In particular, it must stress the primacy of God, because it's only in that manner in which man will see rightly his true place. There is no room for him to be narcissistic when he sees how small he is before God. In the 1950s, at the first mass of a newly ordained priest, Ronald Knox, Monsignor Ronald Knox, preached, and he said words which are true as well today. He said that everyone knows that the best Mass which is offered is the one in which all of the faithful walk out at the end of Mass and ask themselves, who said Mass today? What priest was it? We are meant to lose ourselves in order that Christ, the High Priest, can shine through, in order that we can see the mysteries which are being carried out at the altar. Finally, the pillar is there of a particular attachment to the See of St. Peter. Our founders wrote in their letter of intention, They have but one desire, to be able to live as a religious society in this church and place themselves at her service under the authority, of course, of the Roman pontiff, her supreme head. We need to realize and to know that it is not us who are out to save the church, but we ourselves are meant to be saved by the church. The priest in the first prayer before communion, which he recites each and every day, asks God not to look upon his sins but to look upon the faith of the Church and our need for her in a very visible manner. This is something that we keep very dearly in mind. It is not a matter of pretending that everything is sunny and rosy at every moment. There are indeed problems within the Church, and again our Holy Father regularly reminds us of them. But it is a matter of suffering with the Church when she suffers, and never taking any joy in her suffering but always working to the degree in which we can and according to our duty of state to improve things within the life of the Church, to bring Christ to all those who are within the world. But it is not simply for our foundation that we are thankful for today or the growth that God has given. In a very particular way, we render thanks to God for you, to the many faithful who have supported our fraternity 
and its individual priests throughout the years. We consider ourselves to have been particularly blessed to have faithful who have sacrificed so much at times to establish and to maintain the apostolates in which our priests serve. You, the faithful, have often been an example to us as priests of the generosity which is demanded by God in one's vocation, that generosity which you show towards large families, towards seeking education for your children, towards always looking for the good of another and for the glory of God. We are particularly grateful for the many members of the Confraternity of St. Peter who have associated themselves in, in a particular way with the priests of our fraternity, you who offer your prayers faithfully each and every day for our members. We count on these prayers for both the fruitfulness of our work and also the sanctification of our priests. Dear faithful, I am aware that it is easy for self-adulation to disguise itself as an act of thanksgiving. While listening to the many blessings that I've recited, it would be easy to think that it is simply a manner of giving praise to the fraternity of St. Peter. So while we acknowledge all that God has bestowed upon us, we must first recognize that it is his work which is accomplished. We must acknowledge at the same time that due to our human weakness, which has shown itself many times throughout these 25 years, that we have certainly impeded the full work which he has desired to accomplish through us as an institute. We are also aware that the great history of the Church, that in the grand scheme of things, 25 years is, as it were, almost nothing. Our contribution is negligible when you look at the greatness of the entire Church and the glories of her history. It is the most striking element, perhaps, about this city and even about this parish church, the centuries of history that are contained therein, the battles which have been fought, the souls which have been won. They should give us a certain perspective of how small we are and how much the church has survived without us and that it has no need for us finally. Like the many pilgrims who came before us, we cast our eyes upon the image of Our Lady which is here within this church. It is the same image which St. Philip Neri venerated in his own time. May we cast our eyes upon her as well in these troubled times and ask her simply to intercede for us before the throne of her son. We must always remember that to whom much has been given, much will be asked. May God grant us, through the intercession of Our Lady, the grace to be ever faithful to our foundations, which were given to us 25 years ago, to never take them for granted, and to always correspond more perfectly to the generosity which God has shown us and which he continues to pour down upon us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, Father Berg, having finished what looked from our vantage point to be a very substantial sermon, the, uh, he goes back to the altar with the deacon and subdeacon. in unum Deo. Uh, he will then recite that with the deacon and subdeacon again in the Lord Jesus Christ. The choir sings it uh, in a fuller version. The creed, of course, famously begins with the word credo, I believe. Not we believe, because in the recitation of the creed, whether recited by the priest alone, or by everyone in the church, or by a son by the choir, it's each of us who must take responsibility for his own belief in the fundamental doctrines of the church, through which God leads us to everlasting union with him in heaven. So the creed is a very important expression of faith at the end of the first part of the Mass. 
which has sometimes been thought of as merely didactic in nature because it contains the readings. But as we shall see in the prayers of the offertory in just a few moments, the Mass is the one single, complete in itself, action of Christ. It, as it were, raises us above and out of purely chronological time and into this, puts us into the single moment of Christ's redemptive action on the cross. Therefore, the whole Mass is a sacrifice. In the readings of the Mass, Christ offers to his Father the witness of the truth of God's own self-revelation in sacred scripture. In the offertory of the Mass, Christ offers bread and wine. And of course, in the consecration of the Mass, he offers his body and blood. But it's all one sacrificial offering. Hence, the use of Latin throughout the Mass. It's univocal because Christ's action is one from the very beginning of Mass to the very conclusion thereof. beginning of the offertory prayers. The offertory prayers of the traditional Mass were often criticized in the years when changes for the Mass were being proposed. The critics said that the references in the prayers of the Mass to an immaculate victim and a chalice of salvation and such language was inappropriate because the consecration had not taken place yet and so it was only bread and wine but what those critics had forgotten was what I mentioned to you before that the entire mass is the sacrifice of Christ we are no longer in purely chronological time in which the congregation does something, then they all listen to something, then the priest does something. There's always several things going on in the Mass because the no whole notion of time is subsumed by the overwhelming and inexplicable sacrifice of Christ. And first, in the offertory, Father Berg offers the bread, which will become the body of Christ.
he asks God to accept this unspotted host. And of course, host comes from the Latin word for victim. Then he offers the chalice, which has been filled with wine and a drop of water, signifying our mingling with the blood of Christ through his sacrifice, which is effective for our salvation. And so the prayer says, may we now become partakers of his divine nature who deigned to become partaker of our human nature, Jesus Christ our Lord. Then he says, we offer to thee, O Lord, the chalice of salvation, beseeching thy clemency. At that point, Father Berg will put incense into the thurible to incense the altar at this special moment of offering in the Holy Mass. And again, it represents his prayers in persona Christi and ours united with him, as we say at the end of the offertory, we pray that they will ascend to God in a fragrant odor, as does the incense with which the altar is now revered. After he finishes incensing the altar, he himself once again is incensed, and then he washes his hands and recites a portion of Psalm 25. I will wash my hands amongst the innocent, and I will compass thy altar, O Lord. He then says a prayer to the Holy Trinity, most specially appropriate in this church of the Holy Trinity, to receive this sacrifice, this oblation, which we all make to thee. And then he says, very importantly, turning around towards the faithful, brethren, pray that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Father Almighty. The priest alone is capable of offering the body and blood of Christ. Without a priest, there can be no mass, but we are invited to offer our own prayers of petition, of thanksgiving, of sorrow for sin, of intention, to join our prayers with the prayer of the priest, which God so graciously receives. Now the choir is being incensed of the clergy who are in the sanctuary, and then after that, the faithful in the nave of the church will also be incensed. So you can see how the Catholic Mass works. The priest is at the altar praying, the uh, deacon, or ultimately the thurifer, carries around incense. There's several things going on at once. Uh, it's not a linear liturgy. It's a liturgy which is rich with different elements all at the same time, all pointing in the same direction, all praying in the same direction towards God. Mm-hmm. 
de pomnia secula secula odum. When the choir has finished singing, Father Berg will turn around and pray the Orate Fratres, the Pray My Brethren that I mentioned just a little while ago. And then he will begin the preface of the Mass, in which he invites the congregation to commemorate the special feast today. We have a special preface for the Feast of the Apostles. You see the devout members of the congregation in the church, yet despite their silence they participate fully in the Mass because participation begins and ends in the heart a heart united to the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, as was the heart of our Blessed Lady, who gives us an example of true participation at the Mass. At the foot of the cross, she said nothing, and to the eyes of the bystanders, she did nothing. But no creature ever in history could or will be more united to the sacrifice of Christ than was our Blessed Lady at that moment. She does that not only because it was part of her own vocation, but also as an example for each of us to follow. At the conclusion of the preface, we enter into the most solemn part of the Mass, called the canon or the rule of the Mass, which Father says in a low voice because as we get to the most solemn part of the Mass, the priest becomes more and more purely instrumental and it is Christ who is acting. So at the words of consecration, they're whispered in a very low voice which only the priest himself can hear. And yet everyone in the church knows what is happening. And when they look at the host, which the priest will elevate at the conclusion of the consecration, and they look at the chalice which is elevated, they see truly, substantially, and genuinely what the apostles saw who walked with Christ and heard him speak. We are at one with them. They have no privilege which is above ours because we can see with the eyes of faith what they saw with human eyes. The very same one, the very same thing.
Father elevates the sacred host for the adoration of the faithful, who repeat silently the ancient words of adoration, my Lord and my God. And now Father Berg elevates the sacred chalice filled with the blood of Christ for the people to adore. It was Christ who promised us, I will be with you all days, even unto the end of the world. And so he is not in some theoretical way merely, or some intellectual way, or some way that has to do with the understanding only, but in a real and substantial way, every time the holy sacrifice of the Mass is celebrated, the sacrifice of Christ is made present again on the altar in an unbloody manner. Hence our Lord's words, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have life within you. He gives us his very flesh and blood in the Holy Eucharist, really, truly, substantially present to nourish us on our road to heaven. It is not as the Protestant theoreticians of the 16th century thought a spiritual presence merely, or a theoretical presence, but a real and substantial presence which we receive into our bodies. So generous, so loving, so good a God do we have that he would never have neglected us. He would never have kept us from having the gifts that we need in order to get us to everlasting union with him in heaven. And so Father Berg prays that God the Father will accept this sacrifice. And we also mention the saints whose intercession we ask for, because we never, any of us, get to heaven all alone or only by our own efforts but we are aided by a multitude of witnesses, as scripture puts it, who help us to get to heaven. Fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cielo et in terra. Panem nostrum codirianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra. Sicut et nos dimitimus At the conclusion of the canon, Father Berg will recite the Pater Noster, the Our Father, the very words of Christ which he gave us when he was asked how we ought to pray, to which he will 
add some words afterwards wherein he will ask that God may free us from anything that can harm us both in the past, in the present, and in the future to free us from our past sins, our current sins, our future sins because again time is a limitation that we live under but it's not a limitation that God lives under and so he can cleanse our past and our presence and our future and thus we pray that through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Apostles and of all the Saints that through the assistance of God's mercy we may always be free from sin and secure from anything which would disturb our faith. Now, the kiss of peace will be given, in which the priest says, Peace be with you, and the one receiving it says, And with thy spirit. The deacon will then give the peace to the subdeacon, and it will be spread amongst those within the sanctuary. This, of course, goes back to Christ's prayer my peace I give you. At that point, there will be uh, private prayers for the priest, three private prayers which he recites at every Mass before receiving Holy Communion. He says the first one and then they have the kiss of peace and then he recites the other two prayers to prepare himself to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now we prepare for the communion of the faithful, the golden vessels containing the hosts, the body of Christ are removed from the tabernacle and then communion will be distributed by Father Berg to all the faithful.
before the faithful's communion, the confitior is chanted by the deacon, known as the second confitior, because it was already recited at the beginning of Mass, but now it's recited again as part of the rite of preparation for Holy Communion. And the deacon once again invokes God's mercy on all of us who always approach our Lord as sinners. Even when our sins have been forgiven through the sacrament of penance, we nevertheless are sinners and we are reminded that we always stand in need of God's mercy and his mercy is always abundantly available to us. Father Berg then gives the absolution which follows the second confitior. Then he will take the cha the um, ciborium containing the hosts, turn around, and the there will be recited the threefold Domine non sum dignus. Lord, I am not worthy to receive thee, but say but the word, and my soul shall be healed. First, the members of the clergy approach the altar to receive our Lord on their knees, of course, as a sign of reverence and devotion. Then the servers approach the altar to receive their Holy Communion. And then Father Berg goes to the communion rail to begin to distribute Holy Communion to the faithful. This, of course, is an ancient rite amongst ancient rites at Holy Mass. Uh, nobody knows how long, how far back it goes, but the Council of Trent tells us that in all its essentials, the Mass and the prayers of the Mass and the ceremonies of the Mass go back to the, alt to the Apostles themselves. As Father Berg gives communion, he makes the sign of the cross with the sacred host over each communicant. And then he says, Corpus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, custodiat animam tuam in vitam eternam. Amen. May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ preserve thee unto life everlasting. The communicant says nothing and does nothing except the most important thing that anyone could possibly do at such a moment, namely, he receives the body of Christ. And that reception is a participation as deep and profound as there can possibly be. So St. Paul says in one of his epistles, the bread that we eat, the cup that we drink, is this not a sharing in the very body and blood of Christ? The communion rail is covered with a white cloth which the faithful put their hands underneath before receiving Holy Communion as a sign of reverence and devotion 
and so the priest very practically can more easily place the host on their tongue without any of it being uh, lost because as our Lord said to the Apostles take care that not a fragment be lost. This Mass today celebrates, as I mentioned, the 25th anniversary of the Fraternity, who on the 18th of October in 1988 received from the Holy See a document giving the Fraternity status as a Society of Apostolic Life in the Church of Pontifical Rite, that is, being under the Holy Father directly, a great privilege which many religious orders and communities have had to wait a long time to receive, but which was granted to the fraternity within months of its first formation, a very great privilege for which all the members of the fraternity pray to God with great gratitude every day. When Father Bissig came to Rome, of course, there was very minimal allowance for the traditional Mass in the Church. And he and his more or less apostolic companions, they were about 12 more or less in number, and a few seminarians had no guarantee whatsoever of the kind of reception that they would receive in Rome, uh, whether they would be allowed to be what they always wanted to be, the pars sanior, the healthier part of the Society of St. Pius X, which had broken with Rome through the uh, unlawful consecration of bishops. But Cardinal Ratzinger received them most kindly and really cleared the way for them uh, with tremendous rapidity and their fears that they might be forced to change their way of life proved to be totally groundless and the fraternity lives today as it lived in its beginning completely centered on and surrounding and surrounded by encompassed by the holy sacrifice of the mass celebrated in its traditional form Now, Father Berg returns to the altar. The torchbearers go to move away, the reception of communion having finished. And now there will be the cleansing of the vessels that were used, the chalice, the saboria, if any, which need to be cleansed with wine and water. And the priest will also cleanse his own fingers, his thumb and forefinger, which are the only ones allowed to touch the sacred host, the body of Christ. fraternity gives thanks today along with the members of the confraternity who are present at this Mass and who are watching it with you today and who are throughout the world praying for the work and intentions of the fraternity. We pray in tremendous thanksgiving to God that we can be the instruments of the traditional Mass continuing to live uh, in the heart of the Church and even in the heart of the Church's heart here in the Eternal City of Rome. <clears throat> 
And so the instruments of the sacrifice are removed from the altar And then Father Berg will read a short scripture passage called the communion verse, and then he will sing the final prayer of the Mass, the post-communion prayer. At the conclusion of that prayer, he will give the final blessing to all present, He will say a prayer renewing the character of the sacrifice which he has just performed in Persona Christi. And then there will be the reading of the so-called last gospel of the Mass, which is all, almost always the same. It's the very beginning of St. John's Gospel, which is the gospel of the Incarnation, girding, as it were, the faithful with the buckler and shield of the truth of the Incarnation and reminding them that we have seen Christ in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass as one full of grace and of truth so that when the faithful go out into, the, into a world which is ever more challenging to their faith and ever more contradictory to the faith of Christ, they will have the strength that they need to be faithful even amidst the blandishments and the untruths which with, the, with which they are constantly bombarded by an unbelieving world. Father will give the blessing for which everyone kneels and then he turns to the gospel side of the altar to recite the prologue to St. John's Gospel known amongst Catholics as the last gospel because it ends just about every Mass unless once in a while there's a special gospel prescribed on big feast days which takes the place of the Gospel of St. John. They genuflect at the words at caro factum est and his, his at verbum caro factum est and the word became flesh. That concludes the last gospel and now the procession will reform to exit into the sacristy of the church here at Santa Trinita. We want to thank all who have joined us today in the watching of this anniversary Mass, so important in the life of the Fraternity of St. Peter. Uh, it's among its priests and seminarians in both B. Gretzbad and Denton, Nebraska. And we hope that all of you who have been watching will continue to pray for the Fraternity that we may remain faithful to the mission which God has given to us. That is what Pope Benedict asked of us when Father Berg visited him. At the end of their conversation, Father Berg said, Is there anything, Holy Father, that you wish, wish to ask of the fraternity? And the only thing which he said was, Be faithful. So please pray that we always will.
By the way, I believe that the deacon of the Mass was Father de Mallory, one of our priests who has an apostolate in Great Britain. I couldn't quite see. Uh, my screen is uh, a little fuzzy, hopefully uh, less fuzzy than yours, but I think it was Father de Mallory. Everyone genuflects and turns around to join the recession from the church. And thus concludes the anniversary mass. Thank you for joining us today and please remember that uh, you can watch Holy Mass at the same place on your computer uh, just about every day uh, so you're never going to be that far from the Mass even if you should live in a place where uh, for any particular reason the Mass is not offered to you. Um, And best wishes and God's blessings to all of you from us who are privileged to be here in Rome on this day. <laughs>